Well, I'm delighted to be speaking today with Darren Kelland, a global head of private climate at Hawksford in their gloriously sunny uh, HQ here in St. Helia in Jersey. Darren, welcome. Thank you, David. Good to see you again. So your gold sponsor of our event tomorrow night in Jersey, you're a well-known name in the industry, but for those who don't know about the Hawks of Business, perhaps you could give us a sense of the size and scale of the group. Sure, of course. So Hawksford is a, it's a slightly different business than many of our competitors, mainly because the, the, the group is split between what I would say Western Europe and Asia. So we would broadly say that 50% of our staff work in Western Europe, and that's at the moment predominantly in, in Jersey with uh, an office in London as well. And the rest of the group is based in Asia across three jurisdictions there. We have a significant presence in China with a number of offices on mainland China. We have an office in Hong Kong as well. And from a private client perspective, we have an office in Singapore, which goes hand in hand with our corporate offering in Singapore in particular. So right across the group, we're about 440 people split over those various offices. Okay, terrific. And you've sponsored before with us in Singapore and Mumbai. Uh, they were great events in the past. Th those markets are really important strategically for the group, are they, to give you real access into emerging market growth? Yes, of course. You know, like many other Jersey Trust companies, we, we, we try to expand what we do. You know, this is a relatively small market, although it, it services the UK. But Asia is becoming a, a very important part of the, the world of wealth management, has been for many years. But as businesses grow and become more global, then we've obviously focused on areas where we think we can add value. Um, with offices in Singapore, for, for instance, you can gather that Singapore is a particularly important market for us. Uh, there is a base there through which we can attract private clients from across Asia, particularly um, Southeastern Asia. And Singapore is, is perfectly placed as, I think, the, the hub in Asia for, for private wealth structuring. It gives us access to China, it gives us access to Hong Kong, but further afield into Malaysia and Vietnam. And Vietnam, as many people know, is uh, considered to be a real emerging economy from a private wealth perspective. Uh, Mumbai that you mentioned has mm. become an important jurisdiction to us, mainly because we have clients based there rather than have an office there. Mm. So it's a slightly different focus um, in Mumbai than it has been to uh, the rest of Asia, in particular in Singapore. We ran an interesting session with some of your colleagues about inbound investment into the UK from Asia and the additions of uh, the opportunities from Jersey of structuring some of those investments. Do you observe any trends there of Asian investment? Are you seeing any particular um, strong demand from Asia for UK or Europe investments right now? Yeah, I think what's interesting is we're seeing flows of capital both ways. So mm. the, the Asian business that uh, we're involved in and, and have been for a number of years was predominantly set, around, set up around flows of capital from Europe into Asia. So for example, many of our clients are behind some luxury brands, many mm. of whom are household names. And the concept was that many of these luxury brands were finding it slightly difficult to navigate through the bureaucracy in Asia. But having some people on the ground who had been there themselves and done it, we were able to offer those services to, to many corporate clients who wished to establish a presence in Asia. And of course, then having the, the presence in Asia means that we are speaking to clients, corporate and private, who are looking to the UK in particular as a base for their operations. And having a, an office in London, as I mentioned earlier, gives us the opportunity to help those clients structure. So it, the, the trend is particularly around uh, luxury assets. Mm -hmm. and, and that works well from a private client and corporate perspective because luxury assets appeal to individuals, many of whom are our clients but also appeals to the corporate clients that we've got because behind many of these luxury brands is a, a, corp, a huge corporate monster which needs some assistance to navigate some of these markets. So having that presence in, in Asia and in Europe helps us with understanding what the trends are, what the needs are from a client perspective and be able to help them on the ground with exactly what they need. In terms of the structuring toolkit for Asian families, is there any particular trends and you're seeing in the type of vehicles they're using? Um, what are your thoughts around that area? So it, it evolves in a similar way to what we've experienced in, in this part of the world. For, for many years, the traditional structure in, in Jersey for private clients uh, came from uh, UK arrest non-DOMS, and it was a very simple structure mm. uh, with a, a, a trust on top of a, a corporate structure, and the corporate structure held some assets. 
And in, I suppose, the early days of our Singapore private land business, we had exactly the same type of structure. I think with some of the tax benefits that are being afforded to the setup of family office structures in Singapore in particular, we're seeing a trend emerge where some of the wealthier families want to take advantage of those uh, specific tax benefits that uh, the Singaporean authorities have given to families. And as a result, we're seeing a degree more family office structure how, um, coming about in, in Asia for, for clients of, of that nature. And that's great because my, my history is in pri private client and family office structuring mm -hmm. and family office business is of particular interest to me. I think it's, it's an opportunity to really add value to, to our clients. You know, the, the very simple structure that I just mentioned is great, but when you have a family office structure, you really get into the, the business of the family and understand what they need. And quite often what we find is that clients will approach us because they become used to working with us and they know that we can solve many problems. So when a problem arises in a family, be it small or large, they will turn to us and say, can you help with this? Mm -hmm. And quite often we do find a way to help out with those slightly off the wall inquiries from our clients. And do you find also there's other links with the ultra high net worth families, children become come to be educated in the UK, even if the family remains largely present in Asia or they go to the US and that brings in I imagine a lot more complexity, but where you can really add a lot of value. Indeed, and uh, US structure in particular, you know, we, we, we have to engage with our professional advisory network in order to make sure that any structure um, doesn't fall foul of US regulations, for example. So of course, as, as a business, what we want to do is to attract the right caliber of clients um, to, to our business. You know, many years ago, the, the whole ethos of setting up a structure was to uh, make it as tax efficient as possible. And while tax efficiency is still important to our clients, what they want is a structure that is e easy to use. And that means that we have to engage with our professional network to make sure that if there are some US considerations to be uh, implemented into the structure that we, that we do so in an efficient way. Mm. And of course, many of our clients are international now. So while s children in the family may be schooled in the UK, you may find that the family themselves are dispersed across the globe. And that means quite often that it's not just the US or UK considerations that we have to factor into mm. what we do. It's, it's a European uh, uh, dimension that we need to think about as well. And the great thing is with a group the size of Hawksford, we have people who are well versed in navigating through many of these markets and have a network that, ex that extends across the whole world. So, we know the professional advisory network in the US and the Caribbean, for example, and indeed we can replicate that through Europe and indeed into Asia, as we've already discussed. Okay, interesting. And, and what about in the fund space? Do you see family offices using funds for co-investment vehicles? A lot of talk about the private funds and things like that. How do you see that coming through in practice? Yeah, there's been a lot of talk about yeah. it. Um, we have some experience of doing that. It hasn't really grown to the extent that I think people thought mm -hmm. it would grow to. But of course, since the initial interest in this area, we've had the, the small issue of COVID to navigate. So mm. it has probably resulted in people taking a back step from that just for a moment while they, they think about the future and, and what's important to them. Mm. So it's a trend that I hope and expect to see maturing over the next few years. And I know that you're interested in the area of philanthropy and uh, have discussed also a lot of impact investment as, as something that trustees are really increasingly adopting and need to have full knowledge on. Um, how do you think the pandemic has changed the way the clients you deal with are reacting um, and are interested in philanthropy? Well, I, I think people, are, you know, I mentioned earlier, they've had to take a backward step and think about the future. Mm. Um, and, and, I, and I suppose in some respects that's encourage them to focus on what's really important. Mm. And many of our clients want to leave a legacy. Um, I, I suppose the other thing that, that I think goes hand in hand with philanthropy and impact investing is the whole world of ESG. And I, I spoke at length with a client only a few months back about ESG in particular. And we were weighing up the challenges that a trustee has around the investment in ESG compared to traditional investment types. And there's still, I suppose, some reticence amongst trustees to fully embrace with ESG. A trustee's responsibility is fiduciary in nature and therefore they have to generate particular returns for clients. And, and that becomes quite important in many of the discussions with clients. This individual pointed out to me that if we don't pay attention to ESG as trustees, 
then there won't be a world to invest in. So mm. we, we need to, to think about ESG. But going back to philanthropy, I love it when a client has got so wealthy that they want to give their money away, and particularly when they're engaged with us. And over the course of the last five years since I've been at Oxford, this has been a key area that we have explored with clients. And, and it, it starts with a fundamental question to a client. What is your money for? What is your wealth for? What do you want to achieve? In the early days, a client wants to provide for their family and they want to make sure that there is succession planning through the generations. And that succession planning is appropriate. Of course, you don't want to give an 18 year old 25 million pounds because you're not quite sure what they're going to do with it. But once those questions have been answered, we find that clients are much more interested in, OK, what is my legacy going to be? What can I give back? And because our clients are international, they're affected by many different issues. And some of those issues are quite close to home. So, for example, we have South African clients. And what has been important to them is that children in South Africa are given more opportunities in the, the world of being an entrepreneur, which I suppose have not been afforded to them previously. So quite often philanthropy is a very personal journey for our clients. It will, it will come out of something that they've encountered in their lives. You know, sometimes it is health related. You know, many people are affected by health issues and, and COVID has drawn that into sharp focus. Um, plants do, in impact investing, uh, quite often they're prepared to, to, to give their money away and not see a return. But increasingly we're seeing with impact investing that there is an opportunity to make some money. But we're very clear with clients from the outset that they should consider this to be um, money that they're willing to take a step away from and potentially not see a return on. But in some cases, we've been fortunate or the client's been uh, well educated in terms of the investments they've made. And as a result, they've been able to generate a return. And quite often what clients do with that return is they put it back into another project. So this isn't about preservation of wealth per se. It's more about making an impact, making a difference and leaving a legacy. But do you think also advisors could be more proactive actually in tabling philanthropy as something and sometimes opportunities get missed? And I guess once you've seen clients actually have the satisfaction of making these projects come alive and that's enhanced your relationship, you, you're, in, you're encouraged to do more, aren't you? Do you think advisors have an obligation to, to really table these topics? I, I think it's, yes is the short answer, but I think it's difficult for many of our intermediaries, professional intermediaries that we, that we work with to be able to have that initial conversation. Mm. And certainly it's something that I struggled with in the early days of trying to develop a philanthropy practice at Hawksward. And as a result, we spoke to a number of uh, key advisors in the phil philanthropy world to say, how do we broach this with clients? Mm. How do we bring this, this topic up? And I'm very lucky in some respects that the network is, is so good that I have been given a toolkit uh, with which I can approach these questions with clients. I think, I think the rest of the industry has a journey to go on, mm. but predominantly you know, we are driven by what our clients need. And as our clients have a request for more and more around the area of philanthropy, I think um, our colleagues and friends in the rest of the industry will have to get up to speed on the area of philanthropy and how to have conversations with clients in that space. Okay, thank you. You're going to deliver a keynote address tomorrow night to those gathered at the dinner. Um, you've sponsored before and spoken uh, at, at our event to our audience. So what are you going to be saying tomorrow night? What's the kind of key messages and, and takeaways that you want them to think about? Well, I have a beautifully crafted speech, so I, I'm not sure that I want to give the game away just at this moment in time, David. But one of the areas that I, that I will be focusing on is resilience because you know, we, we talk about people outside of our industry, we talk about philanthropy, we talk about next generation. But people in this industry um, have had a torrid few years, you know, it has been difficult, there's been a lot of stress, there's been a lot of worry, there's been anxiety. And yet here we are two years, I suppose, in, in my mind, down the line, and the industry is still going. So I'm going to touch on resilience and I'm going to talk about the resilience of people who work in this industry. Do you think that some of those habits that we've had from work from home are going to really boost productivity as we come out and we combine the face-to-face -face world with the best of digital now. We're sat in your office, which is a wonderful open plan working space that's a different kind of working space, I think, to a traditional office. What's your take on what, what the impact is going to be on, on professional life as we move forward? Well, I think our world has changed mm. and uh, I hope that it doesn't go back to some of the bad hab habits of old. I, I know myself I do a lot less travel than I mm. once did and I suspect that my uh, need to travel will increase over time, but I hope that it doesn't go back to, to where we once were. 
I think as an industry, we need to be adaptable. Mm. And there is increasingly a request from young people who are coming in, into our industry to demonstrate adaptability, particularly around hybrid working. Um, there are huge benefits in being able to afford people in our industry bright, bright talents, uh, the ability to work from the office or work from home. And if we're serious about attracting the best in, in our industry, then we need to have that sort of flexible model. So I, I think the world has changed. I think we have adapted well. Um, I think we have learned some good habits. But when all is said and done, the value of a face-to-face -face meeting can't be underestimated. And I, I do miss being able to see some of my colleagues in Asia, for example, and I'm hoping to get back out and see them and they're not too distant. But at the same time, we have developed an infrastructure and technology that allows us um, to speak to people on the other side of the world in a way that we didn't pre-pandemic. So I'm, I'm delighted that the world has moved on a little bit during that time. It has been incredibly difficult for some, and many families have been affected. Many industries have been affected. Many businesses have been affected. But I think we emerged from all of that stronger with better technology and more focused on what is really important, not only to our clients, but to each other as a, as a business. So I think there have been some positive experiences coming out of the, the dreadful last two years that we've all experienced. Darren, terrific to uh, speak to you today. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow night. And uh, thanks for talking to me today. I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you, David.